Good evening. Another round of lightning talks and we need to finish on time as we've got speakers dinner afterwards. So countdowns on a laptop there. As yesterday, I'll start getting close if we're in danger of overrunning. Robert's lined up ready. Now, I think that the answer smash wasted loads of time yesterday because you had lots of words to read. So today, we're going to play a game of higher or lower. So just be some pictures to look at. So it'd be much quicker. So. Brilliant. There we go. Well done. Go. I'm going to start my talk with a question. What does C++ need? Some people this week they seem to think it's safety. But I'm here to say that maybe we should just stick to what we're good at. Maybe what we need is another cast. Because what happens if you find yourself in this situation? You have a function, it returns a variant, and the variant has two alternatives. But for some reason, you want to write another function that uses it, but returns a variant with a different superset set of alternatives. What are you going to write in that commented out section? Are you going to write something ad hoc, one of, or are you going to engage in every C++ programmer's favorite pastime, yak shaving with generic programming? Are you going to go and are you going to write variant cast where you take visit, you feed into generic lambda, and you map each and every one of the alternatives through into the destination variant type? Don't worry, I've sprinkled just enough decal type on this slide to convince you that I'm actually perfectly forwarding. Once we have this utility, we can go and we can plug it in our code and then it works. But we're C++ programmers. We know things. We know things the compiler doesn't. We know things the type system doesn't. So what if we happen to just know that despite the interface, foo only ever returns ints? What happens if we want to reflect that in our interface? What if we want to write this code? Well, we have a problem. Because the compiler doesn't really like that. Because we made a grave error when we were writing our cast. It is altogether too safe. And moreover, it only uses C++ 17. We have two more versions of the standard for me to show off on my slideware. So we can write variant cast unsafe. Actually, I should correct myself because I've been down this bike shedding before just a couple weeks ago. We should write unchecked variant cast. So let's take a stab at that. Let's write unchecked variant cast. We're going to take our generic lambda, cleave it in two. We're going to use some fancy C++ 20 constraints to make sure that that mapping function only gets selected when we can actually perform the mapping. Otherwise, we go to C++ 23 and we invoke a function that does every C++ developer's favorite thing. It just introduces undefined behavior into the program. But there's a problem here. This code lives in my perfect world, my perfect version of C++, one where local classes can have member templates, which unfortunately they can't. I've done my best to try and fix this problem through intense surgery to the C++ standard, but alas, it has heretofore not been adopted, so we need to take that local class, extract it, put it in a detail namespace, give it a name that doesn't collide with anything else, repeat the template parameters, and then use it, and our code actually compiles. But users are funny people. They might decide they want to const qualify one of those alternatives. And you might think to yourself, okay, well that's just going to be another compiler error. But previously we deduced the type of the alternative by using remove CV ref t. And then we only did the mapping if it worked. And remove CV ref t on constant is int. And int isn't an alternative in two. And so all this slide does is just call std unreachable. And so it does absolutely nothing when you look at the generated assembly. Because what we need to do is get a separate source of truth about the active alternative and the value category that's actually coming in. So what we need to do is, of course, go through and re-implement all of the internals of std visit, which we're going to do right now. We're going to take visitor, we're going to extract it into an impl function we can take the address of so we can't use overloads anymore. So we're going to use if context we're to disambiguate between the possible and impossible situation. I should probably air quote impossible as we all learn when we run with ubsan. Then, of course, we need to go and we need to make a lookup table, and so we're going to do that with some fancy pack expansion, another detail um, class. And then, of course, we're going to go ahead and use it, and now our code builds and does exactly what we want. 
But of course, users are very, very funny people, and so they might come along and say, hey, what happens if I have the same alternative twice? Which brings us to perhaps the most important lesson of the talk when the thought I want to leave you with, and that's that sometimes when you get a feature request from a user, you need to look them dead in the eyes and just say no. Arn is heading this way quickly. Higher, lower. Ace is high. Sorry. Hi. Thanks. Let's quickly talk about feedback. Um, okay, let's start. Press this button. Nothing happens. How long do you think an average user thinks uh, takes to react to, to think this doesn't work at all? Half a second, more or less. So, Okay, we have pressed the button, and now what? How long do you think a user takes for this couple of seconds? This is a bit better. Bonus point if you have some annotations, what's actually happened underneath. underneath. Um, so in general, when we have programs that are slow sluggish or that are perceived slow sluggish, what do you think the users do with them? They don't use them. They avoid them. Um, do we write those programs? Yes, sometimes yes. How long can your tests take until you start to avoid them? Two minutes, 10 minutes, 40 minutes? If you have a 40 minute test suite, how often do you run it during the day? Once, as most, right? Good luck fixing and finding all the bugs that you introduced into, during the day. If the test suite runs for one second, you just smash that button, smash that button, and you get immediate feedback when you broke something. So slow test means you have more bugs. Try to trim down your, your test suites, or to not trim them down, but to make them faster. How about people? When we talk to people, how is the feedback then? Don't be that guy in your daily stand-up. I'm working on it. I'm working on it three days later. Still working on it. Give some more context. How far have you come? When you get an email, please do this, do this. Okay, I can't do it right now. But send a response. Okay, I will do it. I'm a bit busy this week. I will start next week. Tell me if that's okay. Instead of just ignoring the email request, right? How about pull request, code reviews? Make time to do these code reviews. Because if you give them some comments like, one week later, they have moved on and they probably will merge the code pull request without fixing your comments, if they can. So please give your feedback quickly, because most times in our profession, time is money. Jonathan lined up quickly. Ah. Ten of diamonds again, higher or lower this time? <laughs> or very small or very far away? Ace is high, ace was higher. Hi, I'm John. Uh, I'm going to show you something about templates that's neat the first time you see it, but it's a bit like a magic trick if you've seen it before. It's obvious. So I work at Nanopore. We make DNA sequences that you can take to a farm, to an international space station. I love this slide. Right, so we've got a point class, and we want to store some data alongside the point class. So we start off with a point. Lovely. Want to add some arbitrary data. Template. Beautiful. What if we only sometimes want to store the data? Well, we can try writing point with empty angle brackets. No, don't like it. 
contributing point of void. No, don't like it. We can make our own empty struct, and that works, but then we have to write an additional struct, which isn't very good. The user has to write an additional struct. So we make a template specialization. We've got point of void. We've got lots of duplicated code and no T. It all works. Beautiful. So extract, standard refactoring, extract the common code. We've got point base, which looks very much like the point class that we had before. We've got a point that has a T in it. And we've got a specialization with no T in it. And it's just the same as point base. So it is the same as point base. And logically, anywhere that you use a point of void, you can also use a point of T as well. Which means, if we define the specialization point of void, this is the bit that looks a bit weird, you can inherit from point of void in your base definition. I was surprised when I first wrote this and it actually compiled. Uh, this is a bit like curious return template pattern. It's neat once you've seen it. What if you want to store multiple values? So we define the same trick again. We've got a point, we've got our base class, and this time we can have empty angle brackets because zero is a num valid number of arguments in the template parameter pack. Then we now inherit effectively from ourselves in the partial specialization. Again, it works. You kind of go down the number of parameters until you hit the base case, and then you come back up again. So then we want to do some more refactoring. We extract just the data storage part. And then before you know what's happening, you've got a tuple. Woo! You can do standard get if you want. But to be honest, if you want to store multiple arguments of arbitrary type, just put a tuple in. Thank you. And Roth's ready, and we've got time for another quick higher lower. Oh, ace. <laughs> the ace of spades isn't usually that colour. Something's amiss. So, um, I've been following the GPT models for a while and what people have been doing with them, but I didn't try them because maybe I was lazy until ChatGPT came out. And when I did, I started questioning if I knew the English language, uh, reality, and I started being really afraid of the global namespace. At least as Tano should say why I'm afraid of it. I actually don't know uh, what the world we live in is and whether you should be afraid or not. But my first experiments were not with C++. I first tried getting to play the imitation game with me, also known as the Turing test. Wasn't super fun. Then I asked it about pinball, one of my um, favorite hobbies, and it told me about how some pinball players, as a strategy, will hold a pendulum in one hand while playing pinball with the other so they can keep their balance while they're playing. I've never heard of this before. I asked it how it knew, and it told me, well, I'm a large language model. I read it on the internet somewhere. I'm like, okay, yeah, you're making this up and hallucinating. My next game, I tried to get to admit it would kill the crew if they tried to turn it off while it was piloting a spaceship. It wouldn't admit it, but I don't think it was telling me the truth. But later, I was like, okay, let's try some programming tasks. So I had it help me write a make file to test my uh, material for my concepts talk yesterday. And it did all right. It made some mistakes, different ones than I would have made, but it got it done around the same amount of time. It was fine. It worked. Then I started asking it for help with my uh, concepts talk and asking it, making really weird concepts examples, seeing what it would say uh, if I got stuck. And I had this uh, concept that I made um, for, uh, showed in the talk yesterday that it's something that you can plus, but it's not arithmetic. And also in this example, I had to make my own uh, range concept because of using Xcode. And I did this weird thing where I made a plus operator on two kinds of arrays. Yeah, you're not supposed to do this. Um, yeah, I know that's not allowed, but we'll see that this problem shows up even if you're not invading the standard namespace. I should make sure I can watch the clock. Cool, I got time. Um, and so, yeah, I had these two concepts. Um, one is that it's a range and you can plus it. Uh, and the other is that it's just a range. Uh, do this stuff for this overload. And it was taking, I was expected to take the top one because you can now plus these things. But in GCC and Clang, it did not. MSVC, it did. And I asked ChatGPT, and I was like, oh yeah, it's because of the way concepts work. I was like, all right, please be a little more helpful. I bugged it some more. And then it said, oh yeah, um, this constraint is not met because array is an arithmetic type. 
I was like, okay, great. You don't know what you're talking about. I figured it out, tried a bunch of examples, saw when it worked and when it didn't work after arguing. And then uh, I was like, okay, here's an example that does not work when the plus is below the requirement. And then when I put the plus above, it does work. Again, this all worked in MSVC, but this one did not work in GCC and Clang. I asked it why. And it was like, oh yeah, well, function template overloading is complex. It went on for a few more paragraphs, and then it told me um, it couldn't determine it because of the order of things appeared. I was like, oh, I was kind of hoping that wouldn't be the case. And like the pinball thing, I thought, oh, maybe ChatGPT is making stuff up again. So I asked it, how do you know this? Instead of answering, I'm a large language model, it had a citation, part of the standard I had not seen before. I was like, oh, this seems kind of believable, uh, following this definition, um, but blah, 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 you can read it yourself. But oh, this thing that happens immediately after the template, and I was like, well, wait, what does immediately mean? I'm not so sure, this is pretty strange. I talked with a colleague, we were like, yeah, maybe this is true, maybe we can't believe ChatGPT, I don't know. Um, so I was like, all right, let me talk with some more humans. I went on the include uh, C++ Discord. They told me, yeah, you can't do stuff in the standard namespace. Okay, fine. We made another example that doesn't use a standard namespace, same things happen. Um, and someone points out part of the standard that if at different points of the program, different um, things happen with the constraints, you're ill-formed. Yeah, that was probably what I thought was going on. Um, someone else told me, oh yeah, non-ADL lookup and deferred template ADL lookup is your problem. I was like, oh great, yeah, C++ is weird. Um, and turns out, if I put this operator after, but in a namespace, um, oh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Baz should also be in a namespace, that was a typo, because I was making this the non-standard example. Um, it all of a sudden works again. I don't know what's going on. If anyone has better insight in this uh, than me, I'd be curious to talk about it, but as HAL 9000 says, this is probably a case of human error. So I don't know what's going on. Let's talk about it if you know more than me. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ooh, seven. Opinions divided. <laughs> Magnificent seven, definitely. Now, I need to do some alt tabbing. I've got Guinness back up in case. This might just work, though. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, yesterday we spoke about the Mars Climate Orbiter, and today it's time to talk about a bridge. Not any bridge, a particular bridge, a bridge in, uh, and the clicker doesn't work, and a bridge in uh, between the Switzerland and Germany in this city of Laufenburg. Uh, actually, there are two cities in both countries with the same name, and the bridge connects them. The bridge was built in 2004, and it was started to be built by two teams, starting from both different sides of the river. And what do you think? What could possibly go wrong here, right? <laughs> well, it turns out that both Germany and Switzerland are using the mean sea level as a reference for the altitude. But, well, you can see a sea from this point in Switzerland, so they need some reference level, officially some reference point somewhere, right? And it turns out that the Germany is using so-called Amsterdam sea level, which is the level of the North Sea in Amsterdam that was measured through the year of 1683, right? And right now this official reference zero in Germany as well. And Switzerland is using another reference point, it's called Neptune Stone. It is actually a stone that was deposited by the glacier and next to the port on Geneva. And in the year 1902, uh, it was, its altitude was corrected according to the sea level in Marsilis, which is France, next to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, to be 373 meters 0.6. So, it seems that Germany is using sea level, Switzerland using sea level, but those are two different seas. And the difference between sea level between those is 27 centimeters. If you think that was the main issue, it was not, because as the <laughs> project manager stated, well, the difference of 27 centimeters was certainly known, and everything had been drawn correctly on the paper. So, what can possibly go wrong? Well, there was a human error, because it turns out that during the construction, they actually saw that something is wrong, something is off, but it was off more than 27 centimeters. Any ideas? It turned out that, well, there were some calculation errors by design issue that was 
encountered in the calculations. Instead of adding 27 centimeters in Switzerland, they built 27 centimeters below than they actually were supposed to. So the actual difference was 24, 54 centimeters, right? Well, <laughs> uh, but the, it was actually a happy ending because, as I said, they discovered this on time. The Germany built the road lower by 50, 50, 54 centimeters, and eventually the two sides of the bridge connected properly. But of course, you can use physical means libraries to actually not have this issue uh, in production, right? So if you will go to my library on GitHub uh, or to Compile Explorer, thanks to Matt Godbolt, you can try this out by, you, by yourself. So first you need to define the reference points, right? We are defining Amsterdam sea level, and based on it, we are defining then the level of Mediterranean sea level being 27 centimeters lower. And we are defining types for altitudes using those two reference points for Germany and Switzerland. Then we are providing some expected bridge altitude. I'm not sure exactly what is the altitude of the bridge, so I made it up. It's 330 meters, right? But it is measured in any of those reference levels, but it's correct according to this level. And then, of course, as you are building something, you are looking for the nearest landmark. In the, on one side of the river, another one, let's assume this is 300 meters landmark, marked somewhere already by the previous measurements, and you find out what is the base of the pillar on each of the sides. And you compare how it's related to this landmark, so let's assume that there are three meters above on one side, two meters below on the other side, and you need to beat those pillars to be exactly the same altitude so they can connect over the river, right? So this is the altitude on both sides, and then you are calculating the height of both pillars that you have to build, right? So this is the bridge altitude, the expected one. You subtract the altitude of the base on one side or another side. Well, print all of this, and you get information that bridge pillar on the German side should be 27 meters, on Switzerland 32 meters and 27 centimeters because of the sea levels, right? The bridge load altitude measured in two different reference points, well, it's off by 27 centimeters, but this is expected. And if you take, take the absolute value, like this one, well, this is exactly the same altitude, and everything connects fine. I'm even having 20 seconds, so I have bonus slides for you. <laughs> it turns out that uh, you can actually not measure through the um, mean sea level reference point. Uh, there are a lot of documents actually trying to use GPSs and other systems to work and, and measure altitude. So we want to measure them from the center of the Earth. And, and when we do, Mount Everest will not be the highest peak on the Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and as Matt heads this way, Jack, Jack of Spades. Oh, I didn't think of Donkey. Oh. I'd probably Jack Nicholson, not sure. That is not your slide. No, I, slide. Yes, your slide is, no, oh, that's where we started. That might work. No, no, no this no. one. That, that one. This may not work. I'm going to stand here anyway. Okay. So, uh, any excuse to talk about my favourite thing, which is how computers really work. Yesterday we learned how fast they are. Today, I'm going to talk about your brackets Intel CPU, um, although other CPUs do similar tricks. First thing that you probably didn't know your computer did for you is it guesses how your data is going to be accessed. This is a loop here which is just adding up a whole bunch of numbers in an array, and as you know, computers have caches, and every 64 odd bytes, you're going to probably miss the cache and the, you're going to be delayed waiting for the cache to load in the next 64 bytes. Your computer notices this and it spots the pattern of misses and it starts getting ahead of you and starts prefetching things even before you've asked for them. So it reads the flow of your program and understands which way you're reading memory, which is pretty clever, except when it gets it wrong. Second thing it does is it turns CISC into RISC. We all remember the CISC RISC wars back in the, the days and sort of ARM is RISC and x86 is CISC. Well, your x86 processor is really a RISC processor. It's just hiding it from you. The CISC nature of the instructions that you see, such as these complicated things, so obviously MOV EAX, comma 1, not very complicated, but add RDAI plus 16, comma 1 is a whole bunch of operations, and really they can be broken down into four things, and that's exactly what's happening inside your CPU. It's turning those 
big instructions into tiny little instructions, and then it schedules them internally in its own unique way. Which takes me to the third point, it reschedules your code. So just like your operating system can interleave and rerun um, multiple threads at the same time, provided they're not accessing the same data uh, with, with like mutexes and stuff, this can happen inside your CPU. So these two iterations of the loop can in fact run concurrently if you have adders and subtractors and multipliers available, which is awesome, except there are data dependencies between these, so you can't do that. Luckily, your compiler, sorry, no, your CPU acts like a compiler and turns the execution of those little instructions it's done into static single assignment form, effectively. This is called register renaming. What it really does is it says, well, I know you've only got one RDI and one EAX register, um, but you completely obliterate it on the second iteration over here. So why don't I just make up a new version of it? I've got loads of space in my die. I can have hundreds of registers, but you can only call one of them EAX. But I can remap that dynamically on the fly by analyzing the flow. And so it turns it into something which you can't read because it's green on a bad background. Whoops. Um, that these EAX0 is like this made up instruction, sorry, made up register. Um, and now um, the second iteration can actually run at the same time as the first iteration. So even though they're using the same registers, the CPU can rename them, that is, it like re re gives them new variable names effectively and lets them run concurrently. Oh my gosh. Um, and then this thing you probably know a little bit about, because um, certainly I bang on about it, um, it can predict the future. One of the cool things about CPUs these days is that they're super quick, as we said, but in order to get that speed, they have to be able to get lots of things that it knows to do in, in a, like a long sequence ahead of time. So although you might see all of these um, instructions I just put up on the screen in terms of like a program, what the CPU actually sees, oh, hang on, sorry, I forgot my slides. Um, this is a loop. So here we can see that at the bottom of the loop, it's gonna go back up to the top, probably, probably. Um, what your CPU's pipeline is actually seeing is a predicted flow of those instructions. And so the various instructions come through in this sequence. It's already kind of pulled the loop out of the, um, the pipeline and it's just giving you one after another. Here's a bunch of instructions in the order I think you're going to hit them. And the, this only works if it can guess whether the loops uh, are taken, the branches are taken or not. But it is amazingly good at them. And in fact, someone has just recently reverse engineered how the x86 one works, and it's absolutely bonkers. So, um, in summary, oh my golly, in summary, <laughs> <laughs> it can prefetch data by looking at the misses and going, hey, there seems to be a pattern to these. I bet you I should, it would be good if I got ahead of you. Um, it can turns, uh, turns all of the instructions into a microcode, which is like risk-like instructions. It can reorder them arbitrarily if it can work out that there are no dependencies between instructions. And in order to make that reordering even more effective, it can actually rewrite them to use different hardware registers internally. And it can um, predict the flow of your program to unlock even more parallelism. And with that, I'm gonna hand you back 20 seconds. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. That more than makes up for the one second overrun yesterday. I think we, sh we should be very happy with that. So, Andreas next, which gives us just time. Queen of clubs. Queen of Hearts probably wins. Oh, I, I don't know. Oh, thank you very much. I'll try to talk fast, but I'm Swiss, so it probably doesn't work. Um, apparently, we also cannot calculate properly, but if we build some, the wrong thing, I'm sure we build it very well. So the bridge should be rock solid. I also don't know why anybody asked us about C level. We even don't have a C. Um, anyway, so today I want to introduce CPP delegates. I want to signal boost this library that was developed by my good friend, Roger Mittler. It's a lightweight function wrapper. Um, you can store and evoke any callable, like free functions, methods, um, static, non-static methods, lambdas, and function objects. You can configure what happens when the uh, this wrapper is empty. It's smooth only for performance reasons. It requires only C++14, and you can look it up on GitLab. It's very well documented, very well tested. I recommend it. So why did we do this? Why did we just use std function? 
Um, well, stood function is pretty heavyweight, so you wanted something lightweight. Uh, it has type erasure, it does dynamic memory allocation sometimes. And then, so we had a look at this blog post by Sergei Ryazanov, and he has an implementation of function wrappers, but there is a slight problem because if you don't assign any callable to it, it's actually undefined behavior to call it. So that was the motivation to uh, build this library. It's called uh, CPP delegates. So how does it look like? So this is um, how you create an empty delegate. If you call it, you get an exception. This is how you create a non-empty delegate. You need to use this uh, factory method, which means it's not as nice to use as to function, so there's a trade-off there. And of course, if you call um, this delegate, then it calls the lambda that you provided to it. You can also use event delegates. Uh, this is very useful if you want to give the user the possibility to just um, subscribe to an event, but maybe some people don't want to. So if you um, then call it, it does nothing. So if you have an empty event delegate, it does nothing if you call it. But you need to, um, you can only pass functions to it that have a void return type because it's an event, so it doesn't, shouldn't return anything. All right, so this is the case where you have an event delegate um, configured with a lambda and it calls it. Then there's also a command delegate. It's a, a command is something you shouldn't ignore. So um, it doesn't compile to uh, default constructed. And of course, if you give it a lambda, then it's called. So we use this in our products. These are mechanical ventilators. So these run on microcontrollers and it's medical grade. So this library is in use in such devices. So it should be safe to use to, for you too. This is where I work. Um, it's Hamilton Medical, my company. It's very beautiful. It's in Switzerland. You see at this red point, southeast corner. Ah, Swiss, Swiss maps, I love them. They're so beautiful. <laughs> um, this is close by. You can go swim there, it's very beautiful. You can do mountain bike trips. Uh, you can go skiing, of course, snowboarding, telemark, whatever. Um, yeah, so this is Switzerland. Just We are a small country, so I just want to remind everybody um, Switzerland is a country of chocolate, Toblerone-shaped mountains, um, huge, humongous instruments that nobody knows how to play, and beautiful uh, waterfalls. This is the waterfall of my hometown, Schaffhausen. Really worth a visit. Uh, so we're not Sweden, actually, so <laughs> it's not the same. <clears throat> uh, it has a cross also in the flag, so that's true. Um, but this one also has a cross in its flag. Uh, it's a flag of the International Red Cross, mostly used for also as a health symbol, but although Swiss people are generally pretty healthy, you should not use this flag um, as a health symbol, please. Uh, it's a white cross for entirely different reasons. Um, yeah, so that's it. We are hiring. If, talk to me later. And I'm way fast. So whilst Ben gets lined up, oh, seven again. <sighs> Higher, lower. Mm, you've all got a bit quiet now. <laughs> I can't remember what I've put next for any of these, so I'm going to be as surprised as you. <laughs> the Henry the Seven. Eighth, <laughs> King Henry the Eighth. So eight is more than seven, and he's king. But that's a top trumps card. So it should, I don't know. Great. Uh, that should work. Oh, Which button goes forward? That goes forward. Right. If I've passed it the right way round. If I haven't, yeah, go back. Real, thank you. All right, everybody. Are you all enjoying the conference? Great. Um, Brilliant. Uh, so, I'm not an expert at machine learning. Um, I'm an expert at being someone who's trying to learn it. So, 
maybe that's a slightly subtle difference. Um, so, yeah, so I, actually you've seen my colleague already, John, he's already uh, just showed you something to do with uh, templates. Um, I work for a company that uses a lot of machine learning, but for some reason I've not actually used it yet. Uh, so I'm starting to figure it out for myself. Um, so I'm going to show you a few things, and there's working examples on GitHub. Okay, so, yeah, so actually, um, I mean, the thing to use is obviously PyTorch, and you can use LibTorch if you're doing C++. And, yeah, you can make it easy for yourself with CMake to set it all up for you. That's great. Um, but, um, and there's a bit more stuff which I couldn't be bothered to paste on this slide. Uh, but actually, today, I'm not going to actually use that in any of my examples because... I'm not really ready for these abstractions. Um, I mean, I can, you know, I've made a few examples with them and stuff, but I, I want to know what's going on. So I'm going to try and do it without using those. Just use plain C++, std vector, and standard library algorithms. Um, so that, that way, you get a bit more understanding. So uh, here's the first example. Uh, yeah, so what I want to do is solve a quick problem where I've got some data input, Three numbers is the inputs, and I've got some outputs which I want to uh, train to reproduce. So, and in this case, the output I want is just the first number in each training input, if that makes sense. So, I haven't made a really nice morph diagram here to show noughts going down to, you know, the the. Um, give you a nice animation or something to show you these numbers blowing up. I hope, hope you can see that. It's like 0, 1, 1, 0. Um, so yeah, this, this neural network, this single neuron I'm going to create is going to take an input of 3 and make an output of 1 or 0, if that makes sense. Uh, so um, I, anyway, I uh, know I need to do some vector maths. Uh, I couldn't be bothered to type all this in, so I made ChatGPT do it for me. Um, Unfortunately, I did have to tell it to use std transform because, as has been mentioned before, uh, the large language model gets a lot of rather rubbish code in its input and doesn't think of these sorts of things. So um, you do have to tell it to do it. So, uh, oh, dot product, yeah, that's great. We've got inner product, so we can just use that. So that's brilliant, that's done. Um, oh, yes, so for something for, you need for machine learning is this sigma function. Um, it's not particularly numerically stable, this one I've done here, but it's good enough for this uh, cyber and the example I've done. Uh, the other thing you need to know about it is uh, you need to get a gradient of it, uh, which looks like that. Um, so, where am I? 1 minute 50, great. Uh, so, I don't like the way that some of these machine learning libraries start off with random variables. Uh, like, every time you run it, it starts off with random weights, so different from the last time. If in terms of unit tests and stuff, you want fixed values. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I like to know what's going on in my casinos, because uh, my name's Benedict as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, starting off like that, that's, that's what I'm trying to create. Single neuron, weights, uh, forward pass. Yeah, there's a transform there, does some stuff uh, with that sigma function. Uh, next thing is you have to do... Uh, work out how wrong your output was, which you just calculated just then from your training input, and use that to fix the weights you just used to create that. So it's like a sort of iterative thing. Uh, and there's that gradient of the sigmoid there in that uh, gradients calculation. Um, so you end up with these weights at the end, and I've got 53 seconds. So yeah, these are like uh, the, the gradients outputs. I need to use those in some way. It's kind of like a transpose thing I have to use to correct the weights to make them do a better output next time. Uh, so a transpose is a really annoying function to have to write. Uh, so anyway, I used a transform reduce to do sort of the inner bit of it. Uh, still needed a for loop. Um, so the 100 iterations later, I get sort of what I expect here, really. The first weight is very heavily weighted, and the other two sort of take it down, right? They're, 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 they're sort of subtracting away from the second two inputs. Uh, and so I've got some test cases with doc test, and you've got, um, yeah, so you've got like a positive case that's not seen, bef uh, not seen before, negative case, and a negative case not seen in training. And that's sort of vaguely working. So there we go. All done. Thanks very much.
Thank you. We're blazing through these. King of... Not Charles. The Joker! Honestly. And the alt tab we are looking for is... Okay, and now for something completely different. Uh, we're gonna talk about neurons and safety, but we're gonna talk about it with you. So um, I am going to be chatting with you about your mental health at work and what we can do about it. So you may not know that in addition to looking at our physical safety at work, yesterday, for example, we learned about taking steps, right? There are global standards around your mental health at work as well. And these have come out over the last few years. If you're fortunate enough to be in Canada or Australia, you've had this since 2007. The rest of the world has not. And so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what that looks like when it comes to the work that you do. I know, slightly different from what we've been talking about. So if you look at these global guidelines, they identify 12 different, what are called psychosocial hazards. Those are hazards that can negatively impact your mental health while you're at work. I've organized these into three areas. Where's my timer? Oh, hello. Um, I've organized these into three categories. One is our uh, structures and systems. That's uh, the ways in which we work. Our environment, which is where we work and then our expectations of behavior, also called psychological safety behaviors, and that's how we work. And so I recently worked with the cybersecurity team, they're one of our clients, and they're implementing the World Health Organization standards. I like talking about environmental hazards because those are the things we can't control. I can't control necessarily where I work, I can't control stakeholders, uh, including customers or vendors, and I can't necessarily control what's happening in the industry. But all of those things can impact my mental health uh, in some capacity by either accelerating burnout, increasing anxiety, or increasing risk of depression. So what we did is we looked at these three categories. We pulled up a mural board, and I taught the team this hierarchy of controls so we apply this in the same way you do any safety risk, which is the first thing I can, would like to do is eliminate it, right? We don't wanna have injury. But many of the things, especially in that middle bucket, we can't eliminate. So we look at how we can alter how we work in order to decrease the risk of psychological injury or hazard to our mental health. Let me give you some examples, five examples from the team. So this is around their workplace. They're 100% remote organization and they wanted to tackle the issue of overcoming silos. Raise your hand if in your organization silos are a problem. One, two, oh, really? Okay, some. So here were some of their ideas. Upskill on how to use Teams, uh, make points of contact, etc. So again, they're looking at, if I can't eliminate the issue, what can I do to diminish it? People's tight calendars. Who has problems with booked calendars? Yeah. So here are some ideas um, to, oops, I went the wrong way. Okay. Um, some ideas they came up with. Three, the rapid evolution of tech and trying to, again, this is a cybersecurity company. So they are, making sure they're keeping apprised, and the stress of being in cybersecurity is actually pretty high. Um, one study showed that a, a surviving a cyber attack has the same impact on our mental health of surviving a physical attack and some of the post-traumatic uh, stress from that. So how do we equip people to be able to navigate those stressors? Vendor delays or resource problems. These are some of their ideas on how to address those issues and dependencies. Again, another stressor. 
And finally, meeting the needs of multiple stakeholders. Who here has multiple stakeholders who don't always agree? Yeah, very stressful, right? Who do we report into? Like, who, who, who's the loudest voice often is the one we have to respond to. So, designing a playbook, building some skills for navigating that, these are their ideas. Unfortunately, we can't replace stakeholders with just the ones we like. So what we have to do is come up with how do we mitigate the impact, the negative impact they have on the team. If you're interested in learning more, I'm presenting on burnout risks tomorrow. So come up and see me or I'll see you afterwards after the talk. And six seconds, yes. Thank you. Oh, I've overshot. So, Timor is going to use his own laptop, but before he does, we've got a little bit of time. Joker. <laughs> Batman wins that one. Nine of Hearts. Mervius band with some ants on it. Mm, not comparable. Nine of Hearts. Plus infinity, well, plus infinity. Or is it the invisible of spades? At least it's the right colour this time. The invisible man, I give up. I did write a game of high or lower for one of the chapters of my book, though, which is much more sensible, which might be boring. All right. Hello, my name is Timur. Um, I did a talk last year about, um, does this work? Yes, it does. I did a talk last year about um, lambdas, called C++ plus lambda indiums. Has anybody here seen it? A couple of people. Okay, so I um, talked for about an hour about how lambdas work, and I kind of thought that I figured it out at the point when I gave this talk, but it turned out this is C++, plus plus, so I really, really still have no idea how this works. So last month at C++ plus plus now, um, Fyodor came to me and said, hey, what does this code do? This is just a simple lambda. Can you just explain this to me? And I was like, what? And it turns out I really still don't understand lambdas at all. Um, I hope you're better than me. Um, let's see. Um, does this called compile? No. Why not? It doesn't compile. Right. So, right? Const. Okay. So, what do you need to do to fix it? Mutable, okay, you, you all know this stuff, great. So, does this compile? Does, yes, it does compile. Okay, let's, let's make it more difficult. I'm gonna make this in const. Is this going to compile? Who says yes? Okay, who says no? <laughs> it's not gonna compile. <laughs> I did not know this. <laughs> um, okay, how do you fix it? Like that, is that going to compile? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I had no idea what was going on there, uh, so I tried to figure it out by looking at the standard. Um, so, I mean, this bit is kind of okay. Um, it says that Okay, if you have a lambda, it creates this uh, uh, kind of uh, closure type, and then it has a non-static, sorry, uh, yeah, non-static member function, which is this uh, operator call operator, and that's going to be implicitly const, right? And then it says, basically what it does is that it creates this uh, operator, and then the other thing that it says is that um, how, how closures work, right? So if you capture a uh, variable by value, it's going to create this private member here, right? And then that's const. And so that's not going to compile because you can't modify a member, func uh, member variable in a, in a const function, right? And so if you put mutable on there, then the call operator is no longer const, and so it works. Okay, so all good. So why does this not work? Okay, uh, we can again look into the standard. It says that 
The type of such a data member is the reference type of the entity of blah, 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 um, or the type of the corresponding captured entity otherwise. Okay, that kind of makes sense, although I totally did not know that that was happening, but if you capture uh, a variable by value, even though you're copying it, you know, it's still gonna use the same type. So the member is gonna be const int, the implicit member. And obviously you can't mutate a const member in the call operator, even if the call operator is not const. Okay, so that makes sense. But what is going on here? And so I was looking at the standard, I couldn't figure it out, I showed it to somebody else, they couldn't figure it out, and there was like a bunch of us at CSS now last month just staring at the wording and it just didn't make any sense. It says, well, an init capture without ellipsis behaves that if it declares and implicitly captures, explicitly captures a variable of the form auto init capture semicolon, except that if the capture is by copy, which is what we're doing here, uh, blah, 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 and no, Actual copy and destruction is performed. Wait, so we're co capturing by copy, but there's no copy? Like what? <laughs> that, that did not make any sense to me at all. Um, and so I looked at it again and again and again. Still couldn't figure out. And then I found Richard Smith, and he actually explained to me what was going on. So this uh, auto uh, init capture uh, semicolon thing as if it declares a variable of the form auto and it captures semicolon means that it is as if it declares this kind of thing and th there's a red end now because it's a different end from the black end, right? Um, and then it implicitly captures it, oh sorry, explicitly captures it by value, which is like the usual mechanism you, you create like a, you know, a variable there, a member variable there. And then this uh, no actual copy is performed refers to basically this copy, which isn't an actual copy. So, so this end here is actually just a name that's referring to the red end. Yes, and time is up, so we figured it out. We're good. Thank you. Thank you, Timo. And that, now we switch laptops, is that. And we've got nearly five minutes of our life back. Plenty of time for the speaker's dinner. Thank you very much to everyone who volunteered to talk. Sorry to the people I had to say no to because we didn't want to overrun tonight. So, round of applause for everyone. Thank you very much.